Uh, Dan Ramaker wanted me to mention uh, uh, many thanks to all the adults that turned out for Friday Night Frenzy and everyone else that participated. Uh, made it a great success, and he just wanted me to uh, pass that along to you. Many thanks. Uh, turn, if you will, in your copy of the Word of God to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Guys, do I need this boom mic here? Or? Might get rambunc rambunctious and knock it over. Matthew chapter 24, beginning with verse 3. The title of the message this morning is Enduring to the End. Enduring to the End. Matthew 24, 3. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now it's no secret to any of us what's going on in this world today. The, ex <clears throat> the extreme evil that, that has manifested itself, uh, particularly in the last couple of years, and how it's just multiplied and magnified and, and just uh, out of control. <clears throat> this morning before we left for church, we heard that um, uh, someone was... Oh, oh, Patty, what was it um, this morning? Shot seven people? What was that situation? Oh, down at spring break. Ah, yes. And you know how that's been going in the last uh, many, several years. And, and how the, the evil that, is, that has been uh, uh, continuing to grow in that area. And they were having a, some kind of a party. And um, somebody had a gun and shot seven people at the party. Just So we just heard about this. Every day we hear about this, don't we? Just about every day. And um, All right, so the, the disciples wanted to know uh, the answer to these questions. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, they came to him privately. Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Verse 4, And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. Now, a lot of these things are going to, should be familiar uh, to us, that what the Lord is telling them, especially with what's going on today. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Verse 7, For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows, just the beginning. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. He who endures to the end shall be saved. Now, uh, I wrestled with the Lord about doing this. I started getting the idea to uh, put this message together probably a couple of months ago. And I thought, no, we've got to do something different. And he kept bringing me, bringing me back to this. And uh, I said, no, we've got to do something different. And he kept bringing me back to it. And a couple of weeks ago, uh, Dave Single was here, and uh, always loved to see Dave and Val come. Uh, what's, what, always an encouragement to have them here. But Dave taught the evening study a couple of weeks ago, and didn't he talk about this? And um, he challenged us to finish well, to finish well. And so I, I said to myself, okay, that's it. I guess this is what we're supposed to talk about. And um, now, in verse 13, he says, But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Now, the end of what? Well, it's either the end of our natural lives or the end of the, of the, of the age, the end of everything, whichever comes first. 
Uh, that's what's implied here. And he says, he end- who endures to the end shall be saved. Now, uh, if you're not careful, you can get the impression that uh, we have to keep enduring and we have to keep enduring and keep enduring or we won't be saved. And that's not what he's saying at all. This word saved, we usually use it in, uh, in the um, uh, vernacular of uh, people coming to know the Lord. I mean, that's the most common use when we say, oh, so-and-so got saved. But this word has a, a, a broad meaning to it, and depending on the context, uh, it means something different. It can mean to heal, to preserve, to make whole, to deliver, and to, or to protect. And um, in this case, it's deliverance. We are delivered from the wrath to come. That's what this is talking about. He who endures to the end shall be delivered from the wrath to to come. And um, now, um, uh, does this mean I have to be perfect? If I have to endure either in the faith, either to the end of my natural life or if need be to the end of the age, does this mean I have to be perfect? No, you see, our journey is not defined by how many times we've fallen, but by how many times we get back up. Amen? We, we're not perfect people. But you know, God will use us in our moments of perfectness. And there are moments of perfectness. When he, when he can use us, and he knows that he can use us in particular situations to represent him. And uh, what a blessing that is. That um, he knows, the psalmist said, he knows we are but flesh. Uh, but um, by his power and his grace, uh, we can still serve him and, and, and uh, when... When the times when we're not perfect, we, we have the ability to come to him in repentance and be forgiven. And uh, what an awesome God we have. All right? Now, concerning all these things that we've just read in Matthew 20, chapter 24, 2 Timothy 3.13 says, But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse. Does that not sound like the times we're in today? I think so. Now, just as our salvation, and now I'm talking about the fact that we're saved, just as our salvation is all of God, so is our ability to endure all of God. I want you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, Hebrews, James, 1 Peter. And Peter says, blessed, in verse, beginning in verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That begotten us again means we were begotten physically into this world, and now we've been begotten again or born again. And that's what that's talking about. Begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Now I want to read verse 4 again. Pay special attention to it. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Now when I read this verse, I thought to myself, how many people out there are there out there that believe you can lose your salvation? And have they read this verse? I, don't, I wonder if they've read this verse. To an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. And look at verse 5. Who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, verse 6, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. That the genuineness, (coughs) excuse me, (coughs) that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, (coughs) whom having not seen, you love. Though, though, though now you do not see him. 
Yet believing, you rejoiced with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The end of our faith is the deliverance. That's that deliverance again. Uh, we don't wait till the end to find out if we're saved or not. Uh, that's that same, that same difficulty that we talked about a moment ago. Now, <clears throat> verse 8 says, Whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. You know what? I miss the Lord. Now that may sound strange because I've never seen him and neither have you. But, you know, there was someone uh, here, I forget who it was, that was uh, telling me that uh, they spoke that the first three weeks of their relationship with their future spouse was strictly over the phone. They talked over the phone for three weeks. And that developed a desire in them to meet face-to-face -face finally. And isn't that the way it is with the Lord? We, have not been, we were not there with the disciples and so on. But once he saved us, we came to know him through his word. And I, I want to see him, don't you? So I think we can rightfully say we miss him. We miss him. We just long to see him. And um, uh, in, uh, skip down to verse 13 now with me. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in the days of your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And that's what it takes if we're going to endure to the end. It takes that kind of resolve. Now, he mentioned here that we are to rest fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that grace in, in connection with uh, this, this idea of enduring. Talk about that in a few minutes. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to look at two men in the scriptures. One who did not endure and one who did. So I'd like you to turn to Colossians chapter 4 with me. Colossians chapter 4. And this one who did not endure is a man by the name of Demas. And you're probably all familiar with him. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 14. Paul is, is in his closing remarks here. <clears throat> and he says to these people, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. So Luke was on the mission field with Paul, and Demas was also. They were there together with Paul, and there's no indication, and of course we know about Luke very, very well, uh, what a wonderful saint and servant of the Lord he was. <clears throat> we don't know a lot about Demas, but he was there with them. So we have no reason to suspect anything. A negative about Demas. But now move ahead to 2 Timothy with me. 2 Timothy chapter 4. <clears throat> 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 9. And again, in his closing remarks, Paul says in verse 9, Be diligent to come to me quickly, he tells Timothy, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica, Crescens for Galatia, and Titus for Dalmatia. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Crescens now, we, we don't know anything about him. This is the only place in Scripture where, where he appears. But he was apparently on the mission field with Paul, and God called him away to minister in Galatia. So he's doing fine. And Pastor Titus, we know very well. And uh, God called him away to Dalmatia to minister there. But let's, let's zoom in here on verse 10, uh, in the first part of verse 10 concerning Demas. 
Crescens left for Galatia because that's where God called him. Titus for Dalmatia to serve the Lord there. But it says, for Demas has forsaken me. That word forsaken me means abandoned. He's abandoned me. And the reason is that he has loved this present world. Now that's a huge problem, folks. Big problem. Turn with me to James chapter 4. Hebrews and then James. Why is this a problem? Having loved this world, this present world. I mean, we all enjoy certain things that God has provided for us in this life. And, uh, but what is this about Demas forsaking or abandoning Paul because he loved this present world? James chapter 4 and verse 4 says, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now that word enmity means to be opposed to God in a hostile way. To be opposed to God in a hostile way. So whoever wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. See, this was just... Demas was, was more into the world than just what I just mentioned about uh, the things God has provided for us to enjoy. We enjoy the, the, the trees and the, the colored leaves in the fall and things like that. That's perfectly fine. He's talking about the world lifestyle that Demas has, has, uh, has loved and gone into. All right, now move ahead from James, past uh, First and Second Peter, to First John with me. Demas loved this present world. First John chapter two, beginning with verse seventeen or fifteen. And John says, "Do not love the world or the things in the world." If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. And that's that enduring quality that God brings to our lives, that enduring power that God brings to our lives. He who does the will of God abides forever. And that will and that endurance factor comes, comes from God in our lives, as, as we saw Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1 talking about. So Demas did not endure. He's a lo- he was a lost man. And, um, you know, you have to get used to that. There are people that do come in amongst us that are not the genuine article. Uh, the little book of Jude you need to read sometime, tucked right in ahead of Revelation. And it'll tell you a little bit about that. So that, that should not be a, a surprise to you, and that's something we need to, to watch out for and look out for. So that A, we can minister to them, and B, that we can be cautious. Because Satan is, is, a, a, is a very sly adversary. All right, now... In Luke 9.62... There was a man who wanted to go home first before following Jesus. But Jesus said to him, No one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. No one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Further on in Luke's gospel, Jesus said, Remember Lot's wife. He reminds us to remember Lot's wife. Well, what's that all about? Well, do you remember what happened? Sometime, uh, maybe this afternoon or whenever you get a chance, go back, and if you haven't read it in a while, go back to Genesis chapter 18 and read about how the Lord shows up uh, to Abraham and and Sarah, and and, and Abraham finds out that he's, he's going on his way to Sodom to destroy the city because of its debauchery and its wickedness. And Abraham's concerned. And uh, so he prays several times, asking the Lord, will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? And he he lists some numbers. He starts off with about 50 people. If there's 50 righteous there, would you destroy the righteous with the wicked? And the Lord says, no, won't do it. Won't do it, Abraham. 
He says, how about 40? He said, no, won't do it either. How about 30? And he whittles it down to about 10. And then Abraham is, and the Lord said, no, I wouldn't destroy the wicked, oh, the righteous. If, 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 I wouldn't destroy the place if there were 10 righteous there. And uh, Abraham was finally satisfied with that answer because that's about the size of Lot's family. So when the angel of the Lord got to Sodom, the first thing he did, because he's not going to destroy the righteous with the wicked, is he escorts Lot's family out of the city far enough to be safe from the fire and brimstone that was going to destroy that place. But what did Lot's wife do? He, she looked back longingly towards her beloved city that was so wonderful for her in her own estimation and that she was going to miss the fact that it was going to be destroyed, she couldn't handle that, and she looked back and was turned into a pillar of salt. No one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. How many times Pastor Ken has been taking us through Exodus, and uh, what a blessing that has been, and how many times have we seen the children of Israel desiring to go back to Egypt? Go back to Egypt. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, the Lord says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. No, folks, no true Christian in this age will ever leave the riches of a life in Christ to return to the muck and mire of this world. No true Christian, ever. In John chapter 17, verse 14, Jesus said, I have given them, speaking of those who are his, he said, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. He says, they are not of the world. Demas was of the world. Lot's wife was of the world. He says, these are not of the world. Now, those who are not truly born again may join with us from time to time, but they cannot endure. Uh, 1 John 2.19 says the following, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. They can't endure. They have no wherewithal within them to do it. Uh, they, they are not empowered by the Holy Spirit. Uh, they, they, they may mingle with us out of a sense of religiosity with us for a time, but they cannot endure. So here we see an emerging principle that, that we've uh, uh, come through so far. Faith that fizzles before the end was flawed from the start. You see, if you have true faith at the beginning, you will endure. Faith that fizzles before the end was flawed from the start. Demas fizzled out. And, um, uh, and, and enduring is a, is a, a property or, or a, a, a something in our lives that will happen, as we, as we saw in 1 Peter that's ordained by God to those who love him and, and to those who have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. All right, now let's, we've looked at a man that did not endure. That's Demas. So let's look at a man who endured. And you know him well. His name is Stephen. So I want you to turn to Acts chapter 7. Turn to Acts chapter 7. And I'll, I'll give you a little preparatory information here while you're turning. Acts chapter 7. De uh, Stephen was one of the first seven deacons selected by the church, and that took place in, in Acts chapter 6. He was mighty in the scriptures, but the Jews assembled a council from among their members, accusing him of blasphemy, and they set up false witnesses to testify against him. Nonetheless, counsel, uh, nonetheless, the council saw his the, the Jewish council saw his face as the face of an angel. Stephen then began to recall their history to them, beginning with Abraham and continue, continuing with Isaac, Jacob, and the patriarchs, Joseph's betrayal of his brothers, 
Then their bondage in Egypt for 400 years and their deliverance under Moses and the wandering in the wilderness 40 years. Uh, there's a lot of what we did in the walkthrough, the Old Testament walkthrough a few weeks ago uh, that's, that's in Acts chapter 7. Picking it up with verse 37 then. He had just finished telling them about Moses and the wandering of the wilderness. And as verse 37, he says, This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai. And with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us whom our fathers would not obey, but rejected. And in their hearts they turned back to Egypt. Verse 40, saying to Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. He had tarried on the mountain, and they were too impatient, waiting for him to come down. So they took things that matters into their own hands. Verse 41, And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then Stephen told them that because of their idolatry and rebellion, God will one day carry them beyond Babylon. He also told them about Solomon building the temple after the pattern that was revealed to him. Then continuing in verse 48, However, Stephen says, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? Verse 51, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers. Uh Uh-oh. Do you think he's enduring? This is is pretty bold stuff. We're going to talk in in just a moment about where he got this boldness. Verse 53, uh, verse uh, 52, the end of it, of whom uh, you have now become betrayers and murderers concerning the Lord. And then verse 53 who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. Can you imagine? But he being, now did he shrink from that? Can you imagine them running up to him and gnashing on him with their teeth? He did not shrink. He did not shrink. But he being full of the Holy Spirit, verse 55 gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see heavens, the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. There was a fellow years ago, a a tremendous Christian fellow, a singer, and he, and he said concerning the, the lost people, they're running from God with their fingers in their ears. And here they stopped up their ears and ran at him with one accord, verse 58, and they cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul, who would become Paul. And I have an idea, since Saul was listening, Paul was listening to this testimony of Stephen that that probably had a lot to do with his conversion. What a a saint of the Lord Stephen was. What a tremendous servant. And um, so they laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Verse 59, And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. How in the world did Stephen endure such a thing? I mean, we look at this, and and I don't know about you, but I say to myself, I don't know if I could do this. Well, you will. You would. And so would I, and the reason is not because of anything in us. Hebrews chapter 4 says that we receive grace in time of need. 
And the grace that God meets out to us is commensurate with the situation. We're not in Stephen's situation. There may, day may come where we might be, but we're not in it now, so we can't imagine doing what he did. But God will supply the grace needed to do what we need to do and to endure. So um, th- uh, that's how Stephen endured. Now, question number two is, how did Stephen think of what to say in a situation like that? He was speaking in part after he had already received many blows from the stones. How did he think of what to say? Matthew chapter 10, verses 19 and 20 give us the answer. Jesus said, but when they deliver you up, Do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. You see, when the time of need comes, God will empower you, and he will empower me to do what needs to be done, whatever it might be. And in the trials that that we go through that are much uh, less severe than, than this trial that Stephen went through, we will receive a measure of grace and the, and, the, and the words to say, even though it may not be that severe. There's grace in time of need, and it's always commensurate with the need. Uh, you know, we look back at Stephen and we say, well, that was way back then. That's hundreds of years ago. And, and uh, you know, those things, these things don't happen today. And what God did with him, I don't think that goes on today. Listen, how many times, once again, how many times have you heard Pastor Ken remind us, going through Exodus, the God of, that, that was there then, same God today. Same God today. And the time is coming when there's going to be difficult circumstances. There's going to be difficulty. We're okay so far. But uh, as um, uh, Brother Dave uh, spoke to us a couple of weeks ago in the evening in the evening class. It's probably coming, and we need to be prepared. Although the preparation, a lot of it will happen at the at the moment. At the moment, I mean, we can't even guess what might be happening, and maybe we'll be fortunate enough to escape it. So far, uh, things have been pretty good for us. Um, so when they deliver you up, do not worry about what you should speak. And it's the same God that took Stephen through that that will take us through it, no matter what it is, no matter what kind of trial. Now, turn to our uh, our closing passages in Ezekiel, chapter 33. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. Ezekiel, chapter 33. And I wanted to share this with you because it's a sad, sad epitaph of a people long ago in Israel that just had no faith, no conviction. Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 30. We're going to read verses 30 through 32. Ezekiel declares in just a couple of, a few verses previous to this, that the city has been destroyed, meaning Jerusalem. The captivity is upon them. They've not all been completely taken captive yet to Babylon for the 70-year captivity. But it's underway, and the city has been destroyed. And God speaks to Ezekiel here in verse 30, and he says, As for you, son of man, speaking of Ezekiel, the children of your people are talking about you beside the walls and in the doors of the houses. And they speak to one another. Everyone saying to his brother, Please come and hear what the word is that comes from the Lord. Sound and good so far, isn't it? Ezekiel is going to preach, and they're going to come. They want to come and hear what he has to say. Verse 31. So they come to you, God says, as people do. They sit before you as my people, and they hear your words, but they do not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their hearts pursue their own gain. Verse 32, indeed you are to them as a... Look how God describes this, uh, Ezekiel's preaching. 
He says, Indeed, you are to them as a very lovely song of one who has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear your words, but they do not do them. Remind you of a, of a, of a New Testament passage, does it? James chapter 1, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. And here it is, same God spoke this, and it's the same God that said that by way, by way of James, in James chapter 1. You know, I don't know how it is with you, and, um, you know, it's, it's possible that, you know, you, you, you think in terms of coming to church on Sunday, and, and this is what you ought to do, and, and, and we worship here, and, and we've got our duty over with, and, you know, I, I have no idea where everyone here stands. I have a pretty good idea where most of you do, but you know it's possible that, that there's some of you here that, that uh, are, are under a misunderstanding about what true salvation really is all about. And uh, I, I didn't bring this message to you and, and show you uh, the extremity or the extreme of what happened to Stephen to, to scare anybody. Uh, if anything, it ought to bolster our faith to those of us who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Amen? But if you're not certain of your relationship with him, you know, may, maybe there's a lingering question. I'd love to talk to you about it. And uh, after, this, after church, or if you want to call me, whatever, whatever you'd like to do, call Pastor Ken, call Pastor Mike, or anyone else that you, you've come to know here in the church. They all know what to tell you. Um, but I'd just like to challenge you to consider exactly where you stand with the Lord. Uh, he's a wonderful Savior, and, and we are awful sinners. And he died on that cross and shed his blood for the opportunity to redeem every one of us. And you talk about grace in time of need. There's, his blood is sufficient. His blood is sufficient to save the worst of us. So I'd like, just like you to consider that. And uh, as we close, I'd like you to all stand... And considering what we've been talking about, I'd like you to sing a couple choruses of I Have Decided. First one is, is I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. Second one is The Cross Before Me, The World Behind Me, in keeping with what we talked about. Are you ready?